What up guys, welcome back to another video. Today we are gonna teach you 10 tactics based on research. So I'm actually gonna share the scientific studies used in some of these strategies I'm gonna give you on how to get through hunger during a diet. So when hunger creeps up, cravings are kicking up, and you're trying to get through a fat loss phase, how to beat the hunger and get to the end of the diet. Let's get into the video. Before we get into the actual strategies, make sure you do me a huge favor, hit the like button, leave me a comment if you have anything to add or if you have any questions about any of the strategies that I'm giving you today. And last but not least, subscribe to the channel so you can get updated every single week when we drop a new video. All right, number one, go for a walk. Just general movement is an appetite suppressant. So specifically cardio, low intensity cardio, which is gonna not only burn calories to help you on your fat loss process, but it's also going to lower blood sugar and it's gonna regulate your appetite. So sometimes it's good to go for a walk before and or after a meal to help suppress your appetite and lower blood sugar and improve your digestion from the meal that you are about to have or you just had. Strategy number two, another obvious one, larger, less frequent meals. Most times we recommend four to five servings per day. I would say three is the minimum amount of meals you want to eat per day to maximize muscle protein synthesis. So even if your goal isn't muscle growth, your goal is going to be muscle maintenance during a fat loss phase. If you want to maintain the hard earned muscle you have, which also means you need to maximize muscle protein synthesis throughout the day. Research shows that we need at least three boluses of protein per day to really try our best to maximize that. But there's also some good research to show four, maybe five meals really is the peak of where we see the best results for muscle protein synthesis. You can go for six, but it's not necessary. However, when we are during a fat loss phase, as you can imagine, a smaller meal is less satisfying. So if we have a bunch of small meals, even if it's just mental, the psychological aspect can even trigger your hunger because you're having these little tiny feedings that aren't very satiating. So you go through the day getting your calories, but not fully being satiated after every single meal. So what you can do is have three or four meals instead of five or six, maybe even just go with three and make them pretty big. Hit the same amount of calories, but have more calories, more food, per meal per plate and you will be more satiated after every single meal number three low calorie density voluminous foods that's a long it's a kind of a tongue twister it's a mouthful but this kind of piggybacks off of number two and the idea here is pretty simple choose low calorie foods that have high volume this is one of the reasons why a lot of people on a diet have big ass salads you can fill a whole bowl full of romaine lettuce and tomatoes and chicken breast and all these low calorie foods that are also very voluminous so there's a lot of volume to them and they're very very filling. So what we want to do when we are on a low calorie diet or we're chasing fat loss and we want to be satiated is simply choose foods that have low calories but a lot of volume so they fill us up. And research is going to show that the psychological nature of seeing a plate full of food is also going to give you a little bit of a benefit from satiety as well as the actual consumption of those calories. Number four, this one is probably another obvious one, but not enough people really audit their day and do this. And number four is pretty simple. Drink less calories, eat more calories. So instead of having so many whey protein shakes, for example, or if you have any liquid calories through beverages or even sauces and condiments that have calories, go for their low calorie or zero calorie substitutes and just try in general to eat your protein instead of drinking it. There's actually a really interesting study, quite gross to be honest with you, that took chicken breasts and they had two different groups and one group ate the chicken breast like us normal people do and then the other group drank it. So they actually blended the chicken breast and these participants drank the chicken breast. Now, I don't know about you, but if I drank a chicken breast, I would be unsatisfied. But the point is, is the group that ate the chicken breast, they consumed the exact same amount of calories and the exact same amount of protein. But because they actually had to chew and digest and absorb that chicken breast, they had a higher rate of satiety, which meant there was a less likelihood for them to overeat later in the day. Number five, less processed food. There's a lot of reasons for this. One of the reasons is that the thermic effect of food is lower with processed food. So if we're having a lot of packaged food, boxed food, things that are literally processed, especially ultra processed foods, what we are going to find is that they are going to have a lower thermic effect of food that is TEF. And this is one of the aspects of our BMR. So we're not only going to burn less calories by eating it, but we're going to burn less calories through digestion. So if we want to increase the process of digestion absorption, which does lead to better satiety because our body's actually churning and working to break down those foods, and it's actually burning calories by doing so, which is another benefit to our metabolism. We want to eat more whole foods because highly processed foods 
are going to be less satiating. And it also makes sense because if you think of something like a whey protein shake, a protein bar, or anything that is processed, they are taking nutrients in food and they're processing them so they're easier to absorb since they are already broken down. So if they're already broken down, it's less work for your body to do, which in some regards can be beneficial. But during the fat loss phase, when we are trying to avoid too much hunger or cravings, which kicks us off our plan through bad adherence, we want to increase the thermic effect of food and increase our body's ability and need to digest and break those down. Number six, appetite suppressants. This isn't one that I lean too much weight on, but it can help. So things like caffeine, things like water, so drink a lot of water, green tea or other teas, even some fat burners, which a lot of times I don't recommend, and we are gonna do a separate video on this later on, but yohimbine, for example, or synephrine are two legal fat burners who, that have been shown to work to some regards. Both of them can cause an appetite suppressant. So even if we're not seeing a crazy thermic effect where our body's shredding fat off our body from taking this pill, which is what most of the marketing tries to get you to believe, we at least know that there are some ingredients in some fat burners that do help suppress appetite. And that can be one of these factors. But on top of fat burners, we also have things like green tea, caffeine, or even just a high amount of water consumption that can lead to an appetite suppressant. Seven, volumizing ingredients. It's really just a term that I put on this, but essentially what we're doing here is adding things in like baking powder, maybe even PB2. So if you're not familiar with PB2, it is powdered peanut butter. It does not taste the same as peanut butter, it has a really good peanut butter flavor. So if you mix it with water, it turns into a texture and kind of acts like peanut butter. It is not peanut butter. But if you put it in a protein shake, if you put it in a smoothie bowl, if you use it as one of the additives to your food, it does give it a really good peanut butter flavor. But it has a mere two grams of fat for like four tablespoons versus peanut butter, which has 32 grams of fat for two tablespoons. So you can imagine it's a good way to increase the volume of what you're consuming while lowering the calories. Another really good example of this is baking powder. If you have oatmeal and you throw baby powder, baby powder, <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that. If you have oatmeal and you throw baking powder inside of the oatmeal, it is gonna volumize the food. So a really good recipe that I love for a pre-workout meal is gonna be oats, cinnamon, baking powder, whey protein, and if I have enough room, I'll throw some almond butter in there as well. But what this does is it makes a little bowl of oatmeal into a fairly large bowl of oatmeal because the baking powder volumizes it as we add hot water or microwave the oatmeal itself. So this is just a simple thing to, again, make what's in front of you appear bigger, which is psychologically gonna make you more satiated, but also it forces you to chew for longer and it takes longer to get through that meal, which also leads to better satiety as well. Number eight, slow down and chew more. This is a simple one that I remember my great grandmother constantly telling me, she would tell me I have to chew every single bite 27 times. I, I remember this and I always looked at her like, hey, you need to, I don't, I'm 12, I'll be fine. But the reality is, is this is actually a really good, kind of childish, but simple way that most adults also need to approach their food because it improves your digestion. But not only that, it actually leads to a better rate of satiety. So you're less likely to overeat in a meal and there's research to prove this. Uh, they took two groups of participants, and they both had to consume the same amount of calories from apple juice. One group drank the apple juice, which is a normal thing to do. The second group actually had to spoon feed the apple juice. So they literally had to spoon feed the same amount, which obviously took them longer. But the act of extending the duration of time it took to consume the apple juice and doing so by the act of spoon feeding it, which in itself is kind of like chewing, but more or less just duration of consumption extended, led to a higher rate of satiety from the same amount of calories, which is a really cool way to look at this. Now, I don't recommend people go around drinking everything from a spoon, but it just goes to show you if we slow down, it's gonna lead to more satiety and less likelihood of overconsumption. The second study was at a pasta buffet. So they took multiple groups and they separated the groups by duration or speed of chewing. So they had one group that was just like, chew as you need, just consume the pasta at free will. The next group had to chew at a certain cadence, the next group at another cadence, the next one at a slower cadence, so on and so forth. And what they found is the slower people chewed and the longer they forced people to sit and eat the same amount of pasta, the less likely they were to go get more pasta at the pasta buffet. So as you can imagine, the slowest chewing group, which took the longest to eat the pasta at each sitting, actually ate less overall calories at the pasta buffet. And this once again just goes to show, if we slow our chewing down and we take more 
more time per meal, whether that is from counting how many times we chew, or it's just being more mindful of it, or setting our fork or spoon down in between each bite, maybe even setting a timer to make sure that you're staying there for a certain amount of time before going for the second plate or serving, you are less likely to overeat and you are more likely to be satiated and full after that meal. The ninth strategy is to repeat the same food and the same meals over and over again. This is kind of why both flexible dieting as well as meal plans actually work pretty well. And I have two kind of seems hypocritical statements on it because they're on polar ends of the spectrum, but they kind of come together if you really think about it. And the cool thing about this is that research has shown when somebody repeats the same meal over and over again, they are less likely to overeat as that meal progresses. So it's really nice because if we eat the same thing every day, we are less likely to overeat that thing and we are more likely to be satiated from that thing because you somewhat subconsciously get bored of that thing. But if you don't psychologically get bored of it, you will be able to keep eating it. And they showed this in a study using macaroni and cheese. And the two different groups were split up and had to eat five sittings of macaroni and cheese. All the sittings were ad libitum. So you could eat as much macaroni and cheese as you want. What they did is participant group one had to eat mac and cheese five days in a row. As the days progressed, they ate less and less. The other group ate mac and cheese once a week for five weeks in a row. They didn't stop slowing down. They kept eating just as much mac and cheese and by the end of the study as you can imagine they ate way more calories from mac and cheese and they were more likely to overeat and what this shows us is as we eat the same thing we are less likely to overeat and we are more likely to be satiated from the same meal because we've repeated it over and over again hence why meal plans typically work but the other thing i took from this and why i think flexible dieting works really well is because if you're saving up your calories and you just want that one cheat meal you are far more likely to overeat calories because you can't manage or create boundaries for yourself. And we've seen this in the mac and cheese study because they only got it once a week. So by the time that day came and they finally got to eat as much mac and cheese as they want, they literally ate as much as they could. Whereas the group that could have it every day didn't eat as much. And with flexible dieting, we're tracking calories and we're fitting treats and snacks and non-diet foods in, in smaller portions when we can, and you're doing it more consistently. So you're not banking your calories and then splurging or binging when the time finally comes to eat it. The 10th and final strategy to kick hunger while you're dieting is to keep your food pretty plain and bland. And I know that sounds really boring, but the truth is, is there's a lot of research showing that both smell and taste trigger more hunger hormones to keep you hungry, which makes sense, right? This is why highly palatable foods trick you into eating more and more and more. It's why a plain baked potato is extremely filling, but it's not that great. Like we don't love it, but we can't overeat it. But it's also very satiating from a full fiber nutrient perspective. However, if you add butter and salt to that same potato, you could eat plenty of potatoes and overeat that in calories easily. So the studies that show these are, are multiple. There's one in particular that shows the smell and the aroma in a room can actually trigger some of these hunger hormones that get you to eat more calories. And what this may mean is what we can avoid, because we don't want to just avoid anything that tastes good that makes it smell good. But what we can avoid is uh, the aroma of fresh baked goods or trigger food that we often binge on. Just remove it from the kitchen. Because if you go to the kitchen to eat your nicely prepped meal, but you can also smell food from the bakery or you, you smell something that's cooking from your roommate or someone in your family, that's going to trigger more hunger and you're more likely to overeat or finish that meal and then go eat some snacks. Whereas if that smell wasn't present, you'd be more likely to just eat your meal, be satiated and move on about your day because the thought of something else isn't even there. And then the other study is about taste and the exact same thing happened. They had one meal that tasted extremely good and they had one meal that was more bland, same exact nutrients in it, same amount of calories. Of course, the bland food was way more satiating and the good tasting food triggered them to want more and more. So this doesn't mean make your food taste like shit and avoid all good smells. But what it does mean is when you're in a serious fat loss phase, maybe staying away from trigger foods or smells that you know are going to trigger specific cravings because they are more likely to kick up that hunger signal and get you to overeat your calories. All right, that is all 10 strategies to hack your hunger. I can guarantee you can use all these, but I can guarantee you can use at least one or two of these and they will help you push through your fat loss phase and get through the diet much easier and be successful in your journey to lose body fat and get to a new body composition. If you like this video, do me a huge favor, hit the like button. Make sure you leave me a comment if you have any questions whatsoever that I can help you with. And last but not least, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We are dropping videos every single week to help you. And we want to make sure these get out to more and more people. We'll catch you next time.